Hello everyone. Um, okay, let's get started into part two of Intro Micro Forces, Chapter 11, Properties of Liquids. All right. So certain properties of liquids are influenced by the intermolecular forces of the liquid. So namely, surface tension, capillary action, viscosity, and vapor pressure. Okay, first let's talk about surface tension. So surface tension, um, liquids like to adopt the shape of their containers, but you know, why, do wa why does water form droplets um, instead of a like, continuous film? Um, when you when you see droplets like on a car after it's been waxed or detailed, why do we see this property of water? And the answer is um, surface tension. So surface tension is the energy required. Sorry, it should be only one required. Sorry, to increase the surface area of a liquid by a unit amount, and this very varies from liquid to other liquids based on the nature of their intermolecular forces. So if we think about the water drop on a surface, um, what makes the surface tension of water so unique is that the strong intermolecular forces um, between other water molecules. So molecules at the surface are going to feel um, a net attraction to other molecules in the liquid. And that kind of what holds the surface of water together and has such a high surface tension. Um, now, uh, in contrast, the interior molecules um, they experience uniform attractive forces, so they don't feel this kind of net, you know, attractive force um, towards the center of the liquid. So that, you know, kind of like the nucleus of the water droplet is holding this thin layer together, and that's what gives rise to the um, unique surface tension of water. Okay, so if we look at this chart here. We see a bunch of liquids. Uh, let's just focus on the surface tension part. And you see as we go down from the organic compounds, um, we see here that um, the more nonpolar we get, the lower the surface tension. So the easier the surface tension is to break. So you don't see organic molecules having the same properties as water. And as we go towards molecules that are more like water, acetone, ethanol, F1 glycol, we see the surface tension increase um, ever so much, uh, pretty dramatically when we go to F1 glycol, which is kind of similar to water, um, but not really, I guess ethanol would be the closest, um, closest um, to water. But if we look at water here, you see the surface tension is abnormally high here. See, as we go to zero degrees up to room temp, okay. Liquid elements, um, the more the more intermolecular forces you have, the uh, the higher the surface tension as displayed by mercury. And then we look at water here, we see that the surface tension uh, decreases with increasing temperature, um, namely because, you know, um, the intermolecular forces are getting broken. Okay, so water has a very unique, a very strong surface tension, even though it's, um, uh, a very small molecule and that's due to the very polar bonds here okay all right so let's look at these tables based on the values um oh so i recorded this earlier so i circled things um because i thought it was recording okay but um let's just go over it again based on the values in this table if we have stronger intermolecular forces we're going to have a higher surface tension it's going to be harder to break the surface of the liquid and that's because you have stronger imfs in the liquid itself. And then if we look at the values of the surface tension, the higher surface tension will tell us that it's going to be a more polar molecule. So in this case, F1 glycol will be more polar because it has a higher surface tension, okay? So the higher the surface tension, the more polar your molecule is. All right, now let's talk about capillary action. So capillary action Okay, this is so weird. I don't know why my iPad does this, but it says the date is January 9th. I don't know why. Okay, capillary action. So capillary action, um, um, so it's the tendency for a something polar, polar liquid to rise against gravity. So a non-polar liquid can't do this because the interactions are not strong. 
So rise against gravity in a small diameter tube or capillary. So you may have seen um, this has relevance for more like biology, but also for like water, what water does in small tubes. So the smaller the diameter, the higher the liquid will rise in the tube as evidenced by this, this picture here in different diameter tubing. You see the smaller the tube, the, um, the higher the water level will rise and that has to do with the difference in kind of the pressure in the tube and, uh, and the volume displaced. So um, it, it's pretty much the volume displaced, right? Because the smaller diameter, the more volume, the taller the tube will be because of the volume occupied, okay? So what causes polar liquids to do this? Well, there are two, two types of forces that are responsible for capillary action cohesive and adhesive forces. So you may have heard those terms in biology. So cohesive forces, they bind molecules together. So water has strong cohesive forces. So that's why it's harder to evaporate water. And then adhesive forces is like water by being attracted to something else or to a surface. In this case, the surface of the capillary tube. So depending on which type of force is stronger, you can have two different types of, of, of kind of uh, situations here, okay? So let's look at this picture. So here's the capillary action of water and mercury. And we see water has a slightly higher level in the same diameter tube, but uh, it has a different looking meniscus as well. So the shapes of the meniscus are different because of the relative strengths of both the adhesive forces to the glass and cohesive forces to the liquid itself. So we have two different types of situations here. So water, um, we can see that, you see that um, we uh, it has a slightly higher level than mercury and that's because water has very strong adhesive forces to glass, which has polar silicon OH groups and then its cohesive forces are weaker and this causes um, the water to rise up the capillary much quicker than mercury on the left. So mercury on the left, it has weak adhesive forces of glass, doesn't like glass, and it has a stronger cohesive forces. And that's why you see the mercury level slightly lower because the forces causes the mercury to be more packed together, closer together, and that causes the, the level to, um, um, it pulls itself down into the capillary. So it's not, it's not the same situation as with the water. So one neat application of this is how fluids and nutrients are transported up the stems of plants or the trunks of trees. Um, there may be even these types of capillaries in the body. Um, I'm not entirely sure, but, um, in terms of uh, uh, the stems of trees uh, and trunks of trees, um, they have these very small capillary tubes that are made of cellulose. And cellulose is very poor, it loves water, okay? So it makes them very rigid. Cellulose is a very strong polymer, um, a sugar molecule, and it's um, when it binds with other cellulose molecules, it makes the rigid structure of a tree trunk or the stem of a plant, okay? So water, very being poor by nature, will have very strong adhesion forces to cellulose. And because of this, it can rise up against gravity and transfer nutrients from the roots where water um, and nutrients from the earth are gathered. So when you go water a tree or plant, they, you shouldn't water the leaves because that, that's where it releases water, right? Uh, for photosynthesis. So it's better to uh, keep the tree healthy by watering the roots where nutrients are from the soil, the earth, and then that's where water can kind of transfer all these nutrients to be able to um, supply the tree with all the energy it needs, okay? Or uh, for its processes, the cellular processes, okay? So this is especially important because it rises to the top of trees that are more than 50 meters tall. So very tall trees like eucalyptus trees, redwood trees, and other trees of that uh, similar genuses and families. It becomes very important because how can these trees survive if they don't get water? And, and the action of water 
and capillary action makes this possible. So a very, very interesting phenomenon. And without water, it wouldn't make, um, if we have something less poor than water, it wouldn't be able to do this. So it makes life um, on Earth very unique, very interesting, okay? So this is very similar to what a cotton towel does. So cotton towels are also made up of cellulose. Um, they're made of tiny uh, capillaries. They absorb water because the uh, the tiny tubes within the towel they act as capillaries, right? And they wick the water away from anything it touches, like your skin, like when you dry yourself off, and maybe have to wash your face, take a shower. Um, but the thing is, this network of capillaries it's so interconnected, so it, it's kind of like uh, a neat puzzle because um, it just doesn't only absorb at the point of contact, the water spreads throughout the whole towel. So that's why when you use a towel, paper towel, you just can't wet one spot and it stops. And that's why what makes it complicated because um, if you don't have good absorbance, um, you, there's only a limit you can absorb. So it's a network of tubes that kind of represent like a tree or a stem and also um, this, idea of capillary action so pretty cool okay so a pretty neat invention um, to say the least all right so um, that's capillary action let's move on to viscosity so viscosity um, so if you think of something that's viscous is just think of some, uh, liquid that doesn't really like to move on its own it's more oily it's more um, it's more, it looks like a very, like slime, like jello, doesn't like to flow unless you melt it, right? So it's, uh, viscosity is the property of a, a liquid to flow. So basically the resistance of something to flow. So I think the most common examples of a very viscous liquid are like sap, honey, molasses, um, syrup, those sorts of things. Um, so they're not very viscous. So they're very hard to handle, especially in the chemistry lab too, especially like in real life. Um, so very poor things are gonna have be more viscous because they're more attracted to each other, right? So they're not gonna be very, um, um, uh, they're not gonna be very, um, what we say, uh, like water or like a regular liquid where it just flows when you pour it due to gravity. These try to resist the attraction to gravity, okay? So liquids such as gasoline, ethanol, and water, they flow very readily. So we, te we tend to think they have um, low viscosity. Okay. Others such as motor oil, which is composed of many, many compounds, molasses, and maple syrup, they flow very slowly, right? So we don't think them as typical liquids. Okay. So they have a high viscosity okay so not not a very um unique thing to want in a liquid but sometimes that's that's necessary okay and that's just part of nature and just how a uh, property of the of the substance itself okay all right so there's uh, some ways to measure viscosity. There's, there's uh, sometimes in the lab you would use a viscometer, but the most common way is to measure the time it takes for a certain amount of liquid to flow through a narrow vertical tube. Um, similar to like when you draw up liquid into a pipette. So, so if we go back to our table here, um, we, we define viscosity as pressure per second or pressure seconds. So the, so that's kind of like that, okay? So it's, uh, we measure in units of poise, but you don't have to worry about that too much. So the larger the value, the higher the viscosity. So because the longer it took to go through a narrow vertical tube, right? So the more viscous a liquid, the more slowly it will move or flow. So viscosity, we just have to kind of relate it back to intermolecular forces, okay? So for example, compared to ethanol, ethylene glycol has a blank viscosity. So I don't know if you ever used ethylene glycol, but um, it kind of looks like an oil. So it's very slow to, uh, it's very, it doesn't flow very well. 
So ethanol looks like a liquid. It moves like water, but ethylene glycol has a higher viscosity. So we look at our table here and compare to viscosity, ethanol 1.07, but look, ethylene glycol has almost 16 times that. So it's very, it's more viscous. So we're gonna we're gonna circle ethylene glycol here. So a higher viscosity, okay. So what can we attribute this to? Well, ethylene glycol looks like this molecule right down here. It has two OH groups, so it's going to have twice as many intermolecular forces as ethanol. So we're going to say there are stronger intermolecular forces and ethylene glycol makes this more polar, right? Makes the molecule more polar, okay? Then water and ethylene glycol will move less easily because it's more polar. Oh, sorry, this should, this should say ethanol, I believe. Okay, so because it's more polar, it's going to be more viscous, so it's going to move less easily with respect to one another. So that's why ethylene glycol, we don't use it pure ethylene glycol for a coolant in our cars for antifreeze. We need to make it as a solution so it flows more easily. Because if we try to pour pure ethylene glycol, um, it's not going to be very good coolant because it doesn't move, like it doesn't flow as easily as a liquid, so it'll be harder to put in your car. So that's why we make it uh, ethylene glycol. Um, antifreeze is usually a solution of ethylene glycol in water. So that's why um, we use it in that, in that sense. Okay? All right. So let's see how we're doing on time. Okay, so let's start talking about vaporization and vapor pressure. So vapor pressure is also a property of liquids. Um, so, for example, um, if we have a liquid at a given temperature, there will be an equilibrium uh, or state where, you, you know, um, um, where this, the rate between condensation and evaporation is equal. So if we have this closed off to an environment or into our system, uh, closed off, our system is closed off to the surroundings, we can measure the pressure. Uh, so basically the pressure of a system, um, the vapor pressure, like vapor pressure of water, that's due to the pressure above the liquid. Um, that's called the vapor pressure. So that's something to keep in mind, okay? So um, in part A here, liquid molecules will escape to form a vapor. And then um, as sometimes when the vapor collides back to the surface of the water, liquid, it'll condense back into a liquid. So that's called... Um, they're in equilibrium with each other, okay? So eventually you get to a state where the, um, the conditions are equal. Evaporation will equal condensation, okay? So let's talk about that um, in, this, in this part of the slides, okay? So at any given temperature, you're gonna have a fraction of molecules that will have enough energy to overcome the IMFs of the bulk liquid, so they'll escape into the gas phase, right? So increasing the temperature will increase the number of molecules that have enough energy, and that will increase the rate of evaporation until you get to the boiling point where it will continuously boil until there's no liquid left, okay? So vapor pressure is dependent on um, uh, intramolecular forces and the temperature at which your, uh, your vessel's at, okay? All right, so let's stop there and we'll um, pick up in the next video, okay? So I'll see everyone next time.